Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of the American Planning Association, and I am your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, January 21st. It is our first webcast of this new year, so welcome and happy new year. Um, today, we are going to be hearing the presentation, the struggle for equality, overcoming a segregated past. For technical help during today's webcast, you can type those questions in your questions box located in the GoToWebinar tool panel. For your content questions related to the presentation, again, just type those in that questions box and we will get to those at the end of the presentation uh, during the Q&A. Today, we are sponsored by the APA Illinois section, or I'm sorry, the APA Illinois chapter of the American Planning Association. So thanks to you, APA Illinois, for hosting today. Um, we have a great lineup and we're so thankful that uh, you could bring this all-star cast together. Uh, so thank you, APA Illinois. Coming up next on your screen is a list of uh, some of our upcoming webcasts. You can register for these and future webcasts by heading over to our webcast website, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. Today's session uh, has been approved for 1.5 CM credits and uh, one equity credit for those who need their AICP credits starting uh, this year in 2022. There are some new requirements. Um, there is an equity credit. Um, there is also uh, kind of a rotating credit. Right now, this cycle, it is uh, sustainability and resilience. So there are some uh, additional credits that are required for my AICP friends. And today's session qualifies for one of those, the equity credit. So to log those credits, head over to planning.org, log into your My APA account. And from there, you can search by today's title or event number both of which can be found on our website, again, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. If you're on social media, be sure to like us on Facebook. That's where I post important information like date or time changes. I also send out reminder uh, Facebook posts for our upcoming sessions as well. And be sure to head over to YouTube and subscribe to our channel. Just search planning webcast and we'll pop up. That is, uh, we record all of our sessions and we post them onto our YouTube channel. If you uh, head over there, you'll see that we have well over 350 recordings available for you to peruse and view. So make sure you subscribe to us so that you know when we have a new session up and available. So that is the end of my housekeeping items. Um, and I uh, will say that today is a panel discussion, so there won't be a uh, PowerPoint. So I just wanted to say that so that to make sure that everyone knows um, that they're not missing a PowerPoint presentation or anything. And of course, to boot, uh, this is how technology works. Two of our esteemed panelists are uh, having technical issues and we are unable to see their faces. Um, so as Marissa said, Alden is going to be our pretty face along with Marissa for today. We do have two other panelists um, and, you know, I, I don't know, I'm going to be working on the back end to see what I can do to, to try to get them up and moving here. Um, but I'm going to ha go ahead and um, kick things over to Yolanda, who is going to kick us off here. And of course, we can't see her face yet, hopefully. Again, remember to type your questions as you have them into our questions box, and we'll get to those at the end of this panelist discussion. So thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, I'm really looking forward to today's session. So Yolanda, it's all you. Thank you so much, Christine. I really appreciate it. Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, based on where you live. Uh, my name is Yolanda Richards, and I serve as an account manager with ESRI, which stands for Environmental Systems Research Institute. And I'm really excited for this conversation. Thank you so much for being part of this conversation. And um, I just look forward to um, being able to moderate um, as um, we're able to really 
dive deep into this conversation. Um, as we all know, we're deeply passionate about the city of Chicago and um, issues related to racial segregation. And so I welcome um, people's feedback. Please note that around one o'clock central time, we're gonna hand it over back to Christine for Q&A. So if you have any burning questions, please do not hesitate to start um, putting it in the chat. Christine will be moderating that. And so we welcome all of your questions and or comments. So thank you again for joining and I look forward to our conversation. Um, without further ado, I wanted to actually briefly introduce our panel. Um, we have an amazing panel and I'm really excited to get their perspectives and insight on this work, which is really near and dear to us. So first off, we're gonna go in alphabetical order, <laughs> just to be equitable. <laughs> um, we're gonna start with Alden Laurie, who serves as senior editor of the Race, Class and Communities Desk at WBEZ, which serves as Chicago's National Public Radio member station. We also have Commissioner Marissa Navarra, who was appointed commissioner of the Department of Housing at the city of Chicago by Mayor Lightfoot in 2019. And then last but not least, we have Sherman um, Thomas, also known as Dilla, the urban historian, serving as a historian, cultural worker, public employee, and lifelong resident of Chicago's Auburn Gresham neighborhood. So thank you so much to our panelists and I'm, I'm really excited. So you don't get to see my pretty face. I got my hair done and everything, but you know, that's life. Just know that um, I'm really happy that we're able to have this conversation and really dig deep into this idea of what racial segregation is, what it's done to our communities here in Chicago and how we are responsible for how truth telling is really important in our communities and how we can be impactful. So with that being said, I wanted to kind of set the tone and, and really kind of take a moment to acknowledge the work that our panelists are doing. You know, I think this is really important work. Um, we're deeply passionate about it, but it's also hard. It's very painful too. And for some of us, when we talk about issues related to race and segregation, it's very personal for us. For other people, we might be working in this aspect, but it's not maybe something that we have to be interfacing with every day. So I just wanna thank our panelists for the work that they do and highlighting and honoring the fact that this is painful work in some places, but we know it's rewarding. So with that being said, I wanted to start off with kind of a kicker question. Um, if we can have all of our panelists actually start with um, this one question, which I think is really important. Um, if you can briefly describe your work um, essentially what you love about your work and what keeps you up at night, that would be really helpful. And when I say what keeps you up at night, the question is really, what are the concerns or the things that really bother or challenge you that really impact you when you're doing this work day to day? So I want you to be open and transparent as you can be, but um, really think about that question in terms of how your work is really impacting you and what keeps you up. So we're actually gonna start with Alvin and then we'll hand it over to Commissioner and then Dilla. So Alden, if you can start, that would be great. Great, uh, thanks uh, Thanks so much, Yolanda. Um, so I, as you said, I'm a senior editor of the Race, Class, and Communities Desk at WBEZ. Um, I, um, I really enjoy that work. Uh, essentially, I'm uh, an editor, a desk of three reporters who are covering housing, immigration, uh, work and opportunity. Um, we're also keeping an eye on uh, broader issues dealing with, uh, with race, uh, with racial inequality, uh, in Chicago and in the uh, surrounding areas. Uh, the reason why I love that work is because I believe those issues are uh, so uh, impactful and they are so uh, kind of intertwined through all aspects of life, uh, not only here, but uh, throughout the country and you could argue uh, across the globe. Um, and uh, to have a seat uh, leading three very talented reporters, um, uh, kind of sussing out those issues, uh, trying to uh, explain, provide context uh, uh, and history uh, and help people work through uh, how they should uh, think about those things today. And they definitely should be thinking about those things today. I think it's an incredible honor. Um, so it's a joy to be, uh, to be a part of that team and, and to, to be involved in that work. Uh, the thing that keeps me up at night, I, I think is um, the constant reminders of how incredibly uh, entrenched um, our racial issues are. Um, how deeply divided we remain. Um, uh, I try not to look at comment threads uh, on, on uh, social media or, or uh, chats and stuff like that, but, um, but uh, there was a thread and a, a story about um, uh, 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 Kwanah Jones uh, 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 essentially kind of delivering an MLK Day speech 
um, and uh, kind of really kind of kind of really giving people the business uh, in the audience who had uh, were, were raising some questions about her, so on and so forth. And uh, the comments were just awful. I mean, they were just really uh, just very uh, deeply hateful uh, and hurtful and um, and um, I mean, to the degree that it just kind of really turned my stomach. And it's like, you know, I work in a job where I'm, I'm looking at issues of race uh, every single day uh, and have been literally for the past 20 years or so. And I'm still stunned by just how deeply divided um, uh, we are and, and how strong some people still feel and have no qualms in sharing uh, the vitriol. Uh, that that they're living with. Um, so uh, that's what keeps me up at night. That despite uh, the so-called progress that we've made, uh, despite uh, the fact that uh, we've had this moment, uh, uh, this uh, reckoning, uh, supposed reckoning, um, that we still have a very very long way to go before I think we we truly uh, have some kind of common understanding of, of where we are on race. Um, and, and, and the kind of work that we really need to do in order to make some, I would say, some very true and sustained progress. So that that's that's the stuff that that troubles me. Great, thank you so much for that. And I think it's important that you highlighted, you know, the idea of we're making progress, but we still have a long way to go. So thank you for that, Commissioner. If you can share kind of uh, briefly your work and and also what keeps you at at night, that would be great. Yeah, thanks, Yolanda. I'm Marisa Novara, Commissioner of the Department of Housing for the City of Chicago, and that's a that's a department of about 90 people, and um, it's actually a, a newly reconstituted uh, department. For 10 years, it had been a, a bureau within the Department of Planning and Development, and um, so they're uh, coming in after 10 years. There was a lot to do and a lot of staff to build. I'm I'm really grateful that we have. Um, now a whole policy team uh, that we didn't have before. We have, um, I was able to create a new position that's focused on um, community engagement and racial equity, which is um, a really important component for me of, of doing this work. And we'll talk a little bit about that because it was a very important component of the work uh, that I did at MPC, um, much of it together with Alden. Um, was to establish why that um, would be important in any sector and certainly within government. Um, so that's what I do. We do affordable housing development. We do uh, rental. We do for sale. Um, we um, and and we've established a vision of an equitable distribution of affordable housing across all 50 wards and all 77 community areas. So. What I love about my work, it's the most impactful and most meaningful um, work that I've been able to do. And um, I think because I'm, I'm a very practical person, I um, really love and appreciate the ability to be able to actually change laws and to change policies that have such a direct impact on people's lives. Uh, what keeps me up at night, I, uh, I worry if I'm doing enough to institutionalize the way that we're trying to work. Um, by, our, by its nature, an appointed position is only, uh, you know, only lasts so long. And doing things like a racial equity impact assessment, which we've done, uh, does not mean that we have solved uh, racially discriminatory outcomes in our work. It, that needs to be an ongoing uh, way of how we approach our work over and over and over again. And, um, and we're pushing very hard to try to institutionalize that way of working and that way of thinking. Um, but that's my, that's one of my worries is if I'm doing enough to, to achieve that. I'll stop there. No, thank you for sharing that. I think it's important to talk about the the short term and long term aspects, of, especially in a, an appointed position. So thank you for that. Last but not least, Dilla, if you can share a little bit about you and your work and also what keeps you up at night, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so again, definitely sorry I'm not on camera. I guess I got two jobs, right? It's two folds. On the uh, one hand, I am a area operator for uh, ComEd, the public light utility, and I'm very proud of that work too, right? We 
Uh, make sure that the buildings have not only electricity, but safe electricity. And then as a black man from the South side, this particular position affords me the ability to go back to my neighborhood and teach them about jobs that they may not have ever heard about, right? On the South side in, in public high schools, it's like a mad rush for you to go off to college or nothing nowadays. And so being able to tell people about the trades, that the trades are still viable, that at least in my lifetime for the last 40 years, I've never not seen a crane in the air downtown, right? Uh, so, you know, after high school, there's another way that you could be middle class and provide for a family. Uh, so I'm proud of that work. And then on the other hand, I'm a public historian uh, who's using the Internet to share Chicago history. And my, my goal with that is I, I'm a firm believer that people treat the spaces that they know about a lot better than if they don't know about the space. Right. And, and we're the most important to me a historic city in the in the country especially nowadays. And so what I'm, I'm trying to do is maybe change the national perspective about Chicago and then locally just uh, highlight who we really are and what we historically have been and what we, we, we can be and, and make us better. Uh, the thing that keeps me up at night is that um, some institutions here in Chicago perhaps understand that too, but they're slow to act. You know, um, what entertains us, trains us. And urban radio was real slow to, you know, we could have said maybe in the 90s, we don't know what the music is doing, but we really can't say that today. And yet institutions don't offer, you know, um, something different for people to listen to, an alternative to the violence that is in our music. And so what's, what's keeping me up at night is that it appears we know what we need to do. We're just slow to do it and, and, and what's making us slow to do it. Uh, you know, who, who's pulling that string or, or why we can't, uh, see what, why we can't put some action behind what we know we need to do. That's that's what keeps me up at night. Thank you so much for that. I think that's really important. Um, and I actually want to transition it to the next question and keep you on, Dilla. Um, first and foremost, I want to really highlight the powerful work that you're doing on social media, especially with your TikTok videos. I think it's really important to see how you are connecting with a generation of people to um, be able to have ownership of the narrative of their communities, especially in Chicago, and just providing that insight because social media is a powerful tool to be able to connect and inform people. So really a huge fan of what you've been able to share via uh, TikTok. And so it's been really powerful to see how people are learning about Chicago um, in all areas. And so um, I wanna take advantage of your role as a historian for our audience. And so as you and our panel and so many other people may or may not know, uh, many African-Americans we're relocating to Chicago from the South. Um, and this was during the migration to pursue better um, opportunities economically, socially, and so forth. And so Dilla, if you can, could you briefly walk us through some of those experiences when you had black folks arriving um, to, the, to Chicago specifically, and just kind of provide you know, a sense of what those communities look like then, because obviously we know those communities change and transform, but um, it would be great if you can kind of briefly walk us through that process as a historian. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I will be glad to, I guess, to start with, right, we could think of Chicago, say uh, Illinois, but Chicago primarily in the 1900s, there was 10,000 African-Americans in the area. And by 1920, there was close to 200,000. So just in that that 20 year span, you know, you see such a population boom uh, because of, as you stated, the great migration from the south to the north. And that that certainly had a change on on neighborhoods. On the one hand, African-Americans early on that first wave of the migration were used as strike breakers. And so we know, particularly in Chicago, we have a strong labor history. And what we also know that we have a, a very strong, tense racial um, history amongst each other. And part of that is because as waves of African-Americans were coming in, they were leaving uh, sharecropping and, and, and other uh, forms of jobs down south and that didn't necessarily even know what a union was. And so when they got to Chicago, they were, they were using strike breakers uh, at the stockyards and other factories. And that, that also, you know, put tension on them. And so their, their experience, um, wasn't necessarily always the greatest one. They they moved from the South expecting to have uh, a better opportunity when they arrived in Chicago. They Especially before 1950, they found that they could primarily only live in one neighborhood and that that neighborhood was very overcrowded. 
uh, that neighborhood that they were allowed to move into was um, didn't have a lot of uh, investment from the state or the city. And so the infrastructure there was very poor. Uh, so that, that was one thing they found. But because they were uh, kind of forced to live in a narrow tract of land, what they also found was a group of people willing to help each other. Because chances are when you arrived, you were going to run into someone that was from the same town you were from or someone that knew your family in the South. And so uh, they could kind of help you uh, establish yourself here in Chicago. They could kind of give you the lay of the land, what neighborhoods not to go into at night, who who would hire African-Americans, what places you could take your kids to to not be treated uh, unfairly. And so that's that's what they found as they arrived. And then as the Black Belt expanded, our neighborhoods shifted. We started to uh, throw up what we commonly call our neighborhood boundaries. A lot of them developed as the racial covenants developed. And so those those blocks that cut off, say, a Chatham from a Wentworth or, or I mean, a Chatham from a um, Inglewood or a Grand Crossing from a from an Inglewood, those lines, uh, a lot of times those main streets where the African-Americans stayed and it was, you know, like Wentworth, right? You didn't cross Wentworth because that was a racial dividing line. But now Wentworth is the dividing line for Bronzeville and Bridgeport. And so um, that understanding that <clears throat> that collection of activities is what African-Americans found when they when they arrived up here. And so it's a, it's a mixed bag of experience. On the one hand, it certainly wasn't. Um, what they thought it was going to be as far as equality and equal opportunity. Chicago never had a, you know, a law where African Americans had to sit on the back of the train or the back of the bus. But if you're African American and you you went downtown again before 1950, whether the hotel had vacancies or not, you you weren't going to stay there. Whether the restaurant had a lot of room for you to eat or not, they were probably not going to serve you. Um, and so that's a negative experience. But out of that grows what what really grows most of the African-American institutions here in Chicago, you know, the Urban League, the NAACP, and so many other things are allowed to flourish out of Chicago because we're all condensed to one track of land. That, that was so helpful. Thank you for that. And I think, you know, you providing that context is really important because our next question really focuses on how you see communities impacted, how you're seeing the um, impact on res residential segregation and how it's uh, deeply impacting particular communities. And so I wanna kind of transition the framework that you provided for us, Dilla. Thank you so much for that. I want to pro um, really kind of look at this next question, um, focusing on the commissioner and Alden. Um, just looking at your previous work at the Metropolitan Planning Council and really highlighting the cost of segregation report um, as we were able to really note in the data and the information that was shared from the report that residential segregation costs the Chicago approximately $4.4 billion annually in uh, lost income. And so if you can, and we'll start with the commissioner, if you can discuss some of that research that really hit those findings and and really highlight other impacts that segregation had on the city and the region that would be great so i'll start again with the commissioner and then we'll go over to you alvin sure you know uh this work really began for us at mpc around 2015 when the city was revisiting its affordable requirements ordinance which ironically we just updated again last year um, and strengthened it. I, it, it really began for me with a question um, in that context, which was um, the thought that I think, you know, our, our segregated status quo has lots of costs to all of us, but we don't know what, we don't have, a, we haven't quantified them. And so we act as if our status quo is cost neutral and any changes to that would be cost prohibitive. And, and my thought was, I don't think that's true, but I don't have any way to dispute that. And so we started looking around um, at who might be, you know, has someone answered this question? Is there research out there we don't know about? Um, we found that really there wasn't um, an answer to that. And we found um, a partner in the Urban Institute. And what we did, we actually set out to answer two questions. Um, the first one was, what does it cost us uh, in Metro of Chicago? And this was, I, I should point out, it was a regional look, not just the city of Chicago, but the Chicago region. 
what does it cost us to live so separately by race and income? Uh, and that was our, the result of that question was our first report, the cost of segregation. And the second question we asked was given its negative impact on issues of equity, uh, what can we do to change patterns of racial and economic segregation? And that question was uh, what we set out to answer with our second report, which was really a roadmap for how to create a more racially equitable region. So what we did with Urban Institute was to look at the 100 largest metros across the country and look at their outcomes. And ultimately where we landed was to say, so Chicago was in the top 10 of most segregated metros, was to say what outcomes could we expect to see if we were to drop uh, to the median in the country. So not even you know, to the lowest 10, just, just to the midpoint in the country, what outcomes could we expect to see based on what we see elsewhere? And that's where we came up with our findings. So um, the, the region as a whole would earn an additional 4.4 billion in income, which is another 8 billion uh, in the region's GDP. Uh, the homicide rate would drop by 30%. Um, and that has a, a series of, of savings in um, policing costs, corrections costs, um, higher real estate values, et cetera. And then um, finally, that there are uh, 83,000 more people in the region would have bachelor's degrees. And that results in a $90, million, $90 billion total lifetime uh, earnings that we're missing out on as a result of that education gap. And the the main statistical significance we found was in black-white segregation, less so economic segregation, um, less so Latino-white segregation. That was, um, frankly, a surprise for us. And um, and so we, with those findings, we then um, set out to say, well, what do we do about that? Um, as, as a region. And that really, um, as I said, um, became the driving question to the roadmap that we created. And I want to say one thing, and then I want to let, uh, let Alden pick up from here, because we worked on much of this together at MPC. Um, you know, we started out with a focus on segregation, which might think, might lead you to think that your, what to do about it report would be to say, well, how do we become more integrated what we learned in the process um, of listening to people, we had multiple advisors and um, focus groups and interviews. And in the course of that work, what became really clear to me was that this wasn't um, an exercise focused on integration. Um, really, this was an exercise focused on how do we create more racially equitable outcomes no matter where people live. Uh, and that if we're doing that well, we think we will end up with more diverse communities than we have now, but that's not the goal in and of itself. The goal is that no matter where someone lives, they have equitable outcomes. And that really became the shift in, in that second report. And we, uh, we laid out a host of, of changes that we recommended, partly on um, an approach in general that says we should uh, adopt a racial equity lens, we should examine our work through a racial equity lens and adjust for what we find. If we're if we're finding that our outcomes have racially discriminatory impacts, we we shift them, and that applied to everybody: government, private sector, uh, nonprofit, etc. And then there were specific recommendations around housing and education and land use and uh, and so on. So I'll stop there and um, and defer to my colleague. Um, Marissa, this is Christine. I normally don't interject, but this question, it would be useful if I did now. Um, can you tell us where we can find these reports? Are they online? Where, where can we find them? There's several questions that people want to know. Yeah, yeah. Metropolitan Planning Council. Um, it, they are on the Metropolitan Planning Council's website. I'll look right now and, um, oh, I was going to say I'll put it in the chat, but I don't know if I have that option. Um, anyway, it's on. You can uh, um, put it in our chat, and I will um, send it to the to the greater audience. Okay, we'll do. Thanks, Marissa. Go ahead, Alden, if you can. Oh, great! Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah. Metroplanning.org. I want to say is the uh, is the website. Um, um, 
Uh, yes, uh, the uh, cost segregation report, uh, truly transformational work, um, uh, uh, was the cornerstone of my two years, uh, and uh, Marisa was the, the uh, really the catalyst for the project and the leader of the project, and so it was great to uh, to work alongside her uh, on the project. Uh, a, a couple of things I think that the uh, researchers at the Urban Institute made made clear to us in, in, in doing this work in, in terms of the takeaway. So one was that this was not uh, a, an analysis to determine causation. So they were saying, we're not saying that segregation causes these detrimental impacts, the $4.4 billion in lost income, uh, the fact that we're missing out on a 30% lower uh, homicide rate, or these uh, 83,000 uh, more bachelor's degrees that we would have if, if Chicago was at the median. Uh, the notion was that segregation, the level of segregation in Chicago um, was deeply associated with these impacts, um, essentially lower income, more homicides, and, and, and fewer bachelor's degrees. Uh, and that they were so intertwined that the relationship couldn't be explained away by coincidence, that there was something happening underneath the hood uh, where you have segregation and you have these other things and, and they're they're kind of working in, in concert. Um, and so uh, I, I think what it, and, and it's funny, doing our, our, our kind of tour, when we were going around and talking with people, I remember vividly one conversation we had with one of the chief lieutenants at, uh, at uh, Operation Push, which is uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson's uh, organization, uh, and uh, 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 Reverend uh, Jeanette Wilson is her name. I, I would say she's pretty much Reverend Jackson's number two there. Um, and, uh, you know, we went through our spiel and she listened to it all, didn't flinch. And she was just like, well, why didn't you just call it the causes of racism? And that's, that's pretty much what you're looking at. And um, th there, there is no, I would say, metric necessarily to measure uh, racism, um, but the level of racial segregation that we have may be the, the closest thing that we have to it. And so when I think one of the takeaways for me, uh, five years now, walking away from that project, uh, from that first report, I should say, was just that, you know, racism is at the heart of what we're talking about here. And so to double down on Marisa's point around, you know, this isn't necessarily saying that, you know, hey, if we integrate, then everything is is great. Um, I, I think the takeaway was that the way we live, the policies that we enact, the way we respond to things, we're making choices and decisions, um, and we're living in a way that deeply impacts particularly Black, uh, uh, black uh, Chicagoans. Um, they are feeling the brunt of it, and they're feeling it in the measurements that the Urban Institute analysis uh, reflected. Um, and, um, and so when we see racial inequity, um, we should not just understand it as uh, you know the the cost of doing business. This is just the way things are. That that uh, that uh, uh, this is a real cost, and the level of segregation that we have, we know is at least one of the things that is a part of that picture. Um, so a couple of the other things that I think that came out of the research that we did, uh, the companion research that we did uh, alongside Therapy Institute, was trying to gain an understanding of how Chicago racially and economically has changed from 1990 to 2010. And to me, one of the biggest lessons out of that was that it's always changing. Um, that even when we look at our city and our region and we say, hey, we're very deeply segregated, what we don't realize is that we've been changing all along. Even when the covenants came down, as, as, as Dylan made mention of, and that really kind of opened the door to white flight and a lot of very rapid change uh, uh, racially um, in Chicago. Um, uh, it's slowed down, but it's still happening. And so there are moments when we don't, in certain uh, areas, don't look quite so segregated. Um, uh, the neighborhoods that we look at right now on the South Side, uh, Auburn Gresham, Dilla, I, I grew up in Auburn Gresham as well. Um, uh, it, it's, it's been an all black community for many, many years, but at one, one point it was not. And for a brief period of time, it, it was integrated. Um, uh, a number of spaces that are that are deeply black or deeply Latino or even uh, mostly white nowadays uh, have gone through some level of transition. Uh, so, uh, so there are moments when we perhaps have an opportunity to not be as segregated as we've been, and then we miss out. You know, it, it, it's a fleeting, uh, it's a fleeting thing. 
Uh, the other thing that we, we found was that even though we're having these racial transitions happening all the time, there are parts of the region that just don't change. And those parts are wealthy white areas and poor black areas. Uh, by far, these are the, 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 the parts of, of our city and of our region that just seem to be stuck. And uh, I think the takeaways from that was that no one else wants to live in poor black communities other than low income African Americans. Uh, the thing is, almost everybody wants to live in uh, uh, in white communities, given the fact that that's those are generally the communities that that are changing that a lot of people, particularly people of color, are moving toward. Um, but when those areas are very wealthy, those areas are very hard to penetrate. Um, and in some respects, that's how those communities have kind of maintained the whiteness. It's just too expensive for most other people to live there. Um, and so as we are thinking about our region and thinking about segregation, I think those were a couple of lessons to really kind of uh, pay attention to the realities of, of uh, in some ways, how unattractive some parts of our region are and how attractive some of our other parts of our region are and the ways in which that might impact the movement of people, the movement of resources, uh, the movement of opportunity. Um, so uh, there was a lot, I think, that we were able to kind of really kind of bring to the to the to the to the surface, even though I think perhaps intuitively we may have always known these things, but to see them uh, laid out on paper, uh, to see them stretched out over a span of time and to see uh, the deep costs that are associated with uh, that way of living, I think was impactful. And I, I hope it's something that we continue to, to, to look at and talk about and review um, as the, the, the days and years move on. Ooh, I got chills from both of you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I do want to highlight certain things because I'm actually going to reframe some of the questions that we have coming up and hand it over to Dilla because um, you both have kind of answered the next question. But I, I love the framework, Commissioner, that you mentioned where this was more of um, you know a, a study and an understanding because I think there's a lot of uh, conversations about um, integration and how we need to integrate and we need to really find ways of pushing towards that. And I, I literally think about Martin Luther King Jr.'s statement about, I fear that I may have integrated my people into a burning house. And so I think, Commissioner, you, you talked really clearly about the issue of equity, which I think is super, super important. And it, it really frames the issue about being deficient versus being different. It's okay to be in these communities. It's okay to have lived experiences and cultural connection and be able to live amongst each other. That is valuable and that's important. It's when you actually devalue people and dehumanize people because of the, the conversation out in that you talked about, which is racism. Because you are black, because you are Latinx, because you are a person of color, you are not allowed certain opportunities because of that. Therefore, we are going to segregate. That is where I think there is a lot of confusion when people talk about segregation versus integration. And so I think it's really important. And I thank the both of you for talking about that related to issues of equity and access to um, healthy resources that are going to actually create thriving communities. So I think that's really important. Um, Dilla, I want to hand it over to you. I'm reframing some of the questions. I, I want to get your kind of responses to that in two ways. One, I, I really want to get your feedback on this idea of having ethnic enclaves and the importance of that and what that looks like in terms of how we're able to really kind of have this balance of, of preserving ethnic enclaves while also addressing the importance, importance of integration in some capacity. So I, I'd love to get your feedback on that. And then I want to pose it with another question about how we can dream differently. So can we kind of start off with that? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That? Uh, absolutely. One, we just received a lot of good information from the uh, pre previous two speakers. And it, it made me think about some of the stuff I study, right? We talk about uh, the, the economics of segregation. And as he previously stated, Arvin Gresham, you know, has had a swing, it was integrated. And then before that, it was Irish and Italian. Uh, and really, really quickly made me think about the 1959 class at Calumet High School. All of the, I shouldn't say all, but maybe about 85% of the male graduates received the job or help to college as soon as they graduate. This is just one school, this is Calumet High School. This is the class of 1959. The class of 1939, that was their gift. Though. For their 20th anniversary, they went back to Calumet and they helped young men. Uh, that, but that in 1939, it was a group of Irish and Italian people who lived in Auburn Gresham in 1959. Um, 
probably still really high. It might have been, you know, 75, 25 as far as uh, 75 percent white, 25 percent non-white in that area. But then the class of 1959 did not come back to do the same thing for the class of 79. And the difference is by 1979, Calumet is probably 100% black. And so, whereas we can't necessarily say that race is the cause of that, but that is a direct cause of, of that's economic loss, right? Because if they did, that neighborhood would have benefited from you know that assistance, right? We all, we all needed a little bit of assistance. So even in times of, you know, let's say in 1979, it wasn't a lot of jobs to be found. But if the class of 1959 had their connections, they had 20 years running in the workforce, then maybe they would have been able to help the class of 1979. And, and I'm sure your numbers from your study kind of follows that track, right? Like as we isolate people from opportunities uh, that was once in those neighborhoods, you know, we don't pay enough attention that, that we had the big factories, but in every Chicago neighborhood, they had factories that built the nuts and bolts that they shipped to the bigger factories, right? And those were all economic opportunities that left too uh, via white flight. <clears throat> um, so, so to to that whole entire uh, uh, that context of how like the uh, um, the economics of of our neighborhood shifting and opportunity. Like I say, I just wanted to again really say I appreciate that study. It kind of um, shores up what 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 everyone is saying is that not affording everyone an equal opportunity cost us all. And then to your original question, it's one of my favorite things about Chicago is that you can go to a humble park and really feel like you're in Puerto Rico. If you go down Division Street, you're gonna taste Puerto Rican cuisine. You know, other than how much the food costs and what's your change, the lady ain't gonna be able to tell you any English, but y'all certainly gonna understand each other and be smiling when she see you take your first bite. You know, you guys are going, there's a relationship established. But the cool thing about, you can go move in, in Humble Park now, but you just can't try to come there and erase the identity they have established. And I, I think that that part should be preserved in Chicago, right? But on the, on the other side, if you go to a place like, I personally know, I got hired at Common on the north side. I got hired at a decent wage. I tried to go live in Ukraine Village and every landlord that I've met you know, my name is Sherman Thomas. You just a little ambiguous on a piece of paper, but as soon as they saw me, it was like the vacancy went away. And you know, I had a pretty decent com ed job, right? And so I think that's the problem with the the ethnic enclaves that we need to resolve. Like I wasn't moving in to change the way that the folks in Ukraine village felt about each other. Uh, I, in fact, when I did research there, I was impressed. You know, they started the, the people in Ukraine village were red line just like black people because they were Russian and it was during the Cold War. And so they started their own credit union and, and handed out loans to each other in, U in Ukraine village. So I, was, so I was impressed by that, but I was kept out of that ethnic enclave just because I'm black, right? And I'm sure that that happens to others as we try to permeate uh, those spaces. So again, to your question, I think it's great. I think those F, you know, Argyle Street is something that that sticks out to me, right? Like, you know, you can see a lot of just Asian culture up there. But sometimes when when you know you want to move in those areas just because they're close to work, we're really resistant to that. And that part we gotta fix, right? You know, just because we're moving in doesn't mean we're trying to take over. Because the flip of that is I've seen, you know, on the west side, the residents didn't break into the white folks cars and mass it didn't there wasn't any violence as the as people move in and now we call the near west side all the way to western right you know when i was a kid um uh, the united center was a bad area you know now it's a thriving area but they there was no resistance to that change you know black folks didn't 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 treat the people who moved in bad it, it appears sometimes it doesn't go the other way Yolanda, can I say something about that too? Please go ahead. Please go ahead. I I think about this on a personal level. My dad grew up in a Sicilian enclave in Detroit uh, called Cagalupu, and um, exactly all the benefits that you think of when you think of an ethnic enclave for newly arrived immigrants. Um, but what I think is important. Um, in that experience is to think about the element of choice, right? My my grandparents chose to live there to be around family and, and people who wanted the same food and spoke the same language, but had they wanted to move across town to live closer to the uh, 
car factory where they worked, um, they they could have, and they could likely get a um, a mortgage from a bank at non-predatory terms, and they could likely move without uh, fear of arson or violence that you know black folks in Chicago faced when they tried to move out of their neighborhood. And um, so I think it's an important, it's an element that um, we need to consider that gets to a question of choice, right? Like, do we have um, equitable choices? Do, do people in Chicago, something I say a lot is, if you need a subsidy to live affordably, you should have just as many options of where you live as people who do not and need a subsidy. Um, and that's not true today in Chicago. That's that's what we're working toward. But I think the question comes down to um, how much choice do you have in in where you live and the difference in ethnic enclaves and you know the black belt and um, on the south side of Chicago is is very much about choice and um, deprivation of investment and and threats of violence if if seeking to move today it looks different right there's we don't see threats of violence what we see is um banks that don't lend in numbers as bez uh, under alden's leadership uh reported on right we we see uh one loan in majority black and brown communities for every four in a majority white community right so it looks different today um, but we still have versions of that that, that's really important. Thank you for sharing that, Commissioner. And thank you, Della, for your insights on this. I think a lot of what you both shared, you know, um, one of the other questions that was brought up, and I think you both touched uh, upon this, is, you know, looking at some of the ways in which when we talk about racial segregation, we're always looking at the negative impacts that it has on people of color. Um, rarely do we discuss how segregation impacts white communities. And so that really speaks to kind of, Della, what you were talking about when you think about the experiences of what people had in terms of their own unique enclaves and the discrimination that they went through, it's real. And I, I think going back to Martin Luther King's quote, when you saw integration taking place, it was really a hard issue. So the idea of being able to move people into communities where people's hearts were not ready was a, a big, big disgrace. And so that's what really allowed a lot of other challenges when you think about issues of access and resources and equity. Um, it was really a hard issue. And so I think it's really important to share these experiences, but then also talk about how we are all impacted by residential segregation in, in the context of racism in the built environment. So thank you for that feedback and sharing that. Um, I want to turn it over. I'm just looking at the time because I really want to jump into the questions. Um, I'm going to combine two questions, if that's okay. Um, this is actually open to everybody. Um, I, I really want to dive into this idea of the responsibility that planners and local governments have when we're facilitating issues around desegregation and how we're able to address racial equity. And I want to say that to highlight some of the work that's already being done. Um, I know that there's been really powerful work at the city of Chicago with Together We Heal. Um, I know that's been um, pushed by Candace Moore and her work. And um, we're in a place where we're seeing more momentum. We have leaders in positions where there's more conversations to talk about race, to talk about residential segregation. But from your perspective, I'm just curious to know from your experience and what you're seeing in Chicago and the shifts and changes that are happening in various neighborhoods. Um, Dilla, you mentioned this a lot. These areas are changing. You know, um, the south side of Chicago is not what it was maybe 10, 15 years ago. The west side is not what it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. But from your perspectives, what responsibility do you feel that local government and planners have to address these issues? Um, I will start off with Alden, if that's okay, and then I will hand it over to Commissioner and then um, Dilla, if that's okay. So I just had to give myself a mute there. Um, I, I think there's a, a great responsibility uh, uh, for planners um, and, you know, especially for people who are in leadership positions in, in government. You know, I mean, the sad reality is, is that we are a very racialized society. Uh, we are as a city, we are as a state, we are as a nation. Um, and that is a truth that we have to own, uh, no matter how uncomfortable that might be. And when you own it, then you also understand, okay, Every choice I make, every decision that I make, uh, even if my job doesn't explicitly deal with social policy or, or what have you, that there is an element of what I do um, that 
may break upon racial lines, whether it is uh, uh, intentional or not. Um, and so how can I be intentional in, in my work? Um, how can I be responsible in my work to think about these issues so that whatever choices I make, whatever strategies I put forth, whatever plans I put forth, I am at least trying to minimize the potential detrimental impact that there might uh, befall a particular group uh, along racial lines. Uh, and then also understanding that the landscape um, uh, is, is going to be different depending on where people are coming from. Um, based upon the historical nature of, of, of our racialized society, uh, but also because of the ongoing presence and, and impact of institutionalized racism. Um, and so I, I think, uh, you know, whatever your duty is to the public, um, if you understand that in trying to do that job, and as a planner, you know, you're trying to put forth strategies to uh, improve the quality of life, uh, to take advantage of the built environment, so on and so forth, right? Um, really understanding that in that job, you do, even though your job's not explicitly about race, you do have to have a racial view of that work and understand that, hey, I'm trying to figure out how to get a grocery store in this part of town. I can do a certain number of things. I can do the same things you're trying to get that grocery store in a different part of town, and it's gonna get me nowhere. Um, and, and then not walking away and saying, hey, you know, we tried, uh, understanding that, you know, your role, your responsibility is still to improve the quality of life here. This neighborhood needs a grocery store. How do you make it happen? You know, and it may have to look differently. It may, it may have to involve different things. You may have to involve different people. Um, you may have to get on the ground and truly understand why this community is operating differently, why the things that work in certain other places aren't working here. Um, so I, I think there's a great responsibility to really have a view on racial inequity, to have a view on the different uh, life experiences people of different racial groups have in your community, and then from that framework, trying to do uh, and fulfill the role that you, you've sworn to. Beautiful. Thank you so much for that. Commissioner, if you can go ahead and answer that question. Well, I think uh, some of the things Alden said led me to think about um, a truism that I think of a lot that race neutral policies will not get you race neutral results. And, and the reason for that is that this country's autopilot is racism. And even I got to jump in and start clapping. Oh my God, write that down, put that on a t shirt. Oh, I'm going to quote you for only six months. And then after that, that it's my own original thought. I don't know where I got it from anymore, but. I don't say, don't say that race neutral. Oh my God, that's 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 so prophetic. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. That you know, this as good as anything Jay Z has said in the last 20 years. Like that was amazing. <laughs> so I think what's well, thanks, Stella. I think what's um, you know, what's profound about that for me is that I think that. Um, a notion of racism that is about individuals who want bad outcomes for people of color is, you know, uh, often an outdated co construct. And, and perhaps what's much more damaging is how many people don't want to be any part of that, but they come to work every day and they follow the rules and they follow the guidelines of who they can insure and who they can lend to and who they can. And next thing you know, they end up with racially discriminatory results. And that is what we see over and over if you don't proactively solve for it, right? It's the proactive part that um that i think is is what's needed because that is our country's autopilot that's where we'll end up if we don't purposefully shift right and so i think you know from the position i'm in now um i i think there's a tremendous responsibility government has long been complicit with the private sector in stripping wealth and opportunity from people of color and from their neighborhoods so uh we got to be front and center of saying we're going to do things differently and some of that is about changing policies and changing laws which we've tried to do a lot of in the last two and a half years and some of it is about um, taking a more proactive stance. Uh, and uh, so two examples, um, I look, I'm thinking right now of two communities, um, Pilsen and Woodlawn, where as a city, um, we in Pilsen, for instance, we just acquired uh, six acres of 
vacant land uh, that we will now be putting forward in an RFP for affordable housing in a community that's lost tremendous affordability, lost tremendous Latino population. Um, you know, I saw it as this is our this is our job is to go out and acquire that and make sure it's available to keep as much affordability uh, for folks who've been here to be able to stay. Similarly, in Woodlawn, where we have uh, we have concerns about rising real estate value with the Obama Presidential Center, um, there's a proactive role for government to play in partnering with communities, and, and we have and we are, right? And we're looking, we, we passed an ordinance there to make sure that we're putting the resources in this space so that the people that are there now can stay, who want to stay, and that we're building back a middle class in that community. So I think there's, um, I mean, it's one of the things I find so important meaningful about this role is that I do think government has such an important role to play based on the history where we weren't, where we needed to be and we're not, the history of where we, you know, actively um, subjugated people and the power that we have to do good uh, in, in these roles. Thank you so much for that. Um, and last but not least, Dilla, if you can share your thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think uh, the both uh, previous speakers uh, stated things very ed uh, eloquently. Um, it isn't like, when we think about what government can do, we're not necessarily saying, hey, like, write all the black people on the south side and west side a check to make their lives better since you you had your foot up there, but for a couple generations like that, that ne isn't necessarily the thing, but it's exactly like you're saying, like when you see um, neighborhood gentrification occurring and it's causing the price to go up. There ain't nothing wrong with, you know, um, attaching certain things to property development, right? Like saying, hey, we see this trend is happening. And so maybe we need to keep a certain number of two flats in a particular war, right? Maybe we need to just save them. And that's not, and it does, because we understand that two flat buildings is the backbone of uh, residential how affordable residential housing you know here in the city it, it's it's only so much you can charge a person when you live under them right as far as like you know the the two flat rent goes so so those type of things but then also um i have nothing against bike lanes right but like the south side already has uh very few job places right you close 50 of the schools so we're all going to the same five high schools that are okay and then where we already had a parking premium, I think I, I think we are too dependent on automobiles as well. But it seems like the city does things without coming to talk to us. And that's and I guess that's what we mean by there are things the city can do uh, to kind of strengthen racial equity and investment and opportunity. And one of those things is come talk to folks like if some they'll have a blanket suggestion about what streets and sands to do for a city why without having had one kind of town hall meeting in in arvin gresham in inglewood in challenge because if you came we would tell you like hey we want to ride bikes but we don't need those lanes yet you're going to take away a lane of traffic and since all of us got to drive to schomburg to go work at the call center anyway we need both lanes of traffic right now as soon as you put the jobs here you can take away a lane of traffic because i'll be able to ride my bike there but no one in Roseland can ride a bike to work, you know? And so like those type of things hurt us because then what happens? Now you're gonna ticket me for being parked in this bike lane. We don't even ride bikes here. Now two tickets gets my car booted. Now after I can't get the boot off, you take my car. I'm getting ready to get fired because I can't make it to this suburban job that I've been driving to because you put a bike lane here without talking to us. And like those type of things government can, you know, not do, right? The same way we see Chicago as a city of neighborhoods, you know, every now and again we have to govern them that way too. What's good for Rogers Park may not necessarily be good for Pullman. What's good for Pullman may not necessarily be good for North Lawndale. And it's it's the city's job to to since it's the city that set us up in these neighborhood enclaves via various policies. It's the city's job to uh, provide policy in that in that same manner. So that's one thing. And then the other thing. It's just being really, really <clears throat> thoughtful on when you play stuff. There ain't no reason why that that Wind Trust Arena ain't on the west side. You know, there's so much vacant land on Madison, and as soon as you would have put it there, they would have protected it. And then, and then there's opportunity. The Wind Trust could have been where uh, the Ida B. Wells project is certainly uh, was now, right? So much vacant space right there on King Drive. 
you know, that's the other thing. If the city knows that it's been strategic and in not investing in certain spaces, you know, maybe be strategic in investing in them now. Thank you so much for that, Della. I think that's really important. You laid out such a beautiful framework of kind of the cause and effect based on poor planning practices and, and policies and how that really impacts communities. So thank you for giving that overview and really helping us to kind of understand the importance of participatory planning, engagement, listening to people, and understanding that if the city has kind of created these neighborhoods by design, then there's a responsibility to adhere to that and understanding that these neighborhoods are different, not deficient, but they're they're essentially different. Thank you. So uh, we are a little over. I want to hand it over to Christine. I'm sure that we have a couple of questions that we want to share with the panelists. So I'm going to hand it over to you so you can share those with us and we can answer as many as we can with our time. Wonderful. And boy, do we have the questions. So um, I'm just going to dive right in and we'll see how, how far we can go. Um, First, um, I just want to reiterate a housekeeping, two housekeeping items. One, we are recording this session and it will be available again, like I said, on our YouTube channel. Just head over to YouTube and type in uh, planning webcast series and our channel will pop up. So we are recording this. Um, and then secondly, if you do have questions, just type them in, in the chat box. Uh, we'll see if we can get to it. All right, uh, our first question. Would anyone happen to have a map that can sh uh, they can share that can demonstrate segregation in the city today and what it may have been at a previous time? I have tons of them, but uh, we're not set up to do presentations. So um, maybe we can do a, a different kind of follow up through APA. And I will add, as you know, someone who works for a mapping <laughs> data company, I would be more than happy to provide some of the resources that we have that really show before and after kind of shots of some of that information based on demographics. So I would love to do that. When I heard maps, I, I jumped up internally in my soul. So yes, we definitely have that information. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, and I will gather up all this info from our panelists um, and put it together. And um, I will have it posted onto our um, our website uh, so that you can have that. The same place that you went to, to register for today's session on our website, that's where I'll, I'll post all that information. Thank you. All right. Any recommendations for us in the many states that do not even have tools, policy, and programs to advance equity? Many states have or are implementing preemptions or changes to processes that can make it even more difficult to overcome segregation and advance equity. Well, I have one, I, I suspect the question is, is probably thinking bigger picture about um, zoning changes and, and regulatory changes, but I actually have a um, more personal level thought on that, which is, um, you know, when affordable house, when a development with affordable housing is proposed in your community, don't let people hijack the process. And that is a that's at a personal level as a resident. I think what happens for a lot of us is, um, this just happened recently because um, I live around the corner from a read a public housing redevelopment and we got a letter as a resident saying, hey, we're gonna have a community meeting about the redevelopment of, of a site here. Um, and I think what's very natural for folks is to say, oh yeah, they're gonna redevelopment, re redevelop that, great. I'm, I'm all for it. Throw the letter out because you're all for it. You don't need to go to the meeting, right? But the people who aren't all for it will be there, trust me. And I think what is really needed is that um, there's, um, a provision for the elected officials and for the appointed officials that they can point to and say, look, there is support for this development. People do want this here. People see affordable housing as an amenity, as a positive for their community. And if you stay out of those conversations, it's very easy for the folks who don't want that uh, to carry the day in terms of the narrative. And so that is just on a personal level where you can get involved in your community and your town and um, to, 
uh, be a voice and organize your neighbors and, and be a, a organized set of voices saying uh, this matters to us and we support this and we'll be behind it. All right, thank you. Um, folks, head over into your chat uh, box and I just put another link in there from, um, um, who sent that to me? Was it Alden? I think so, yes. yes. And I just forwarded it to everybody, thank you. Um, so there's an interactive map there for you to kind of see the, the changes in the shift. Um, great. So uh, the next question is, it sounded like ways to create the economic benefits could be described as gentrification. More people with bachelor's degrees, for example, um, would be an economic benefit. So how do you all think that Chicago can get the benefits, get benefits without pushing people out, if that makes sense? You wanna start, Alden? Uh, sure, sure. Yeah, I, you know, this, this is, this is, uh, you know, this is the challenge, right? I, but I think, um, I, I think one of the kind of the central things to keep in mind is that, um, you know, the, the segregation is a, is a measure of, of, of our, of our problem. Um, and I, I think organic development um, is development that, that, that attracts uh, uh, higher income people, uh, more educated people, uh, generally people uh, who are white. And we see that uh, the downtown in Chicago is booming because it has drawn a lot of those young urban uh, white professionals downtown. And, uh, and so along with it has come bars and development, uh, those cranes that, that Dilla talked about. Um, and that's the organic way that we develop. Um, it's been much more, it's a different story to develop communities of color. Um, and what we have not learned is how to do that. Uh, the median uh, household income in Auburn Gresham and in Chatham in 1970, when those were kind of freshly minted majority black communities was higher than it, it was in Lincoln Park. Uh, now Lincoln Park was a different kind of community back then, um, but Lincoln Park today is a community that is literally on autopilot in terms of, uh, of development and econ economic growth. Um, it's a largely white community, largely middle upper middle class community. Um, Auburn Gresham and, 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 and Chatham have remained uh, black, I would say middle class, low middle class communities, but they're not the communities that they used to be. Um, and that's because we haven't learned how to sustain those communities. Um, so part of our challenge is to learn how to develop, um, how to bring uh, 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 development, uh, middle-class uh, folks, uh, higher educated folks, how to bring those people to those communities, but also how to grow those people from the communities which they, which they are. Uh, and if you look at our education system uh, here in Chicago, there are challenges uh, there in terms of kind of developing that base, that economic base from, 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 the, from the talent that we have here locally. So we just haven't learned how to do that yet. Um, and I think we've leaned too much on the organic and the easiest ways, the ways in which we've always known it to happen. And that's why when we see development happening in communities of color, generally it's development that's coming through gentrification. And ultimately um, uh, it's resulting in communities uh, that aren't gonna look like the communities that they had been for some time. And Latino Chicago knows this all too well because when those communities have changed uh, and gentrified, ultimately they have not been uh, Latino communities anymore. We don't see that change so much in black Chicago, but I would say, take a look at Bronzeville today and come back and look at Bronzeville 20 years from now. And I think we will say, you know, hey, Bronzeville looks a lot different. It's booming, but it's not booming the way people had hoped it would have boomed back in the 1980s and 1990s. Okay, um, I wanna take us back a step just based on the questions that I'm seeing. Um, I wanna step back and talk a little bit about some fundamentals uh, around segregation and communities. First of all, um, there was a, a question that came in and it sort of took me back 
um, for a moment, and I thought that maybe we need to, to talk about this for a moment. If we could kind of define what segregation is today. Um, what I feel like segregation might have been in the 1960s and what it was assumed to be um, isn't what it is today. I think it's a lot larger of, of an issue. Uh, there's a lot more at play, perhaps, than what we've read about in our history books for those of us who didn't quite live through the 60s. Um, so if someone could just kind of take a step back for us and give us, you know, an, an elevator, a quick elevator talk on what segregation is today. Who wants it? <laughs> Putting you all on the That's a tough one, right? Um, a lot of what segregation is today is it's still what it, what it was, you know, 20, 30 years ago. It's just not necessarily called that, right? Again, um, you know, what, what segregation looks like today is, um, you know, your your name identifying who you are, despite you having the credit score and job to move into uh, one of the downtown high rise apartments. Right. Uh, that's that I, I would consider that a form of uh, segregation. But then. Um, just just the access to, to public transportation a little bit. Right. Like I, it, it, based on who finds themselves not not having access to public transportation, it, it feels like segregation, but that that's a a, a, a real heavy question. I, I don't know if we would today call it segregation. It, it, it's it's more like a um, just like a, a preconceived bias based off of uh, of who people are. To, you know, also based off whatever side of town they they from, right? You know, because I, I see. African Americans from the North Side treated different. It's, you know, if you're African American and you say, "Hey, I went to Lane Tech," you know, a barrier has come down immediately, right? Because you're 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 from the North Side. So, I, I would love to hear what 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 Alden and Marissa have to say, Commissioner Marissa have to say. But uh, it 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 kind of still feels the same as it always has. It's just uh, not called that as much. I think what's I think what we know to be true is that when with the start of the Great Migration in 1916, um, when Black people were told you can live here and no one nowhere else, that set in motion a series of things that even when that edict was removed, uh, those the things that set in motion don't just go away. So um, your social networks, your access to credit, things of that nature that gets set in motion in one direction and not another, um, when laws change, when we say, okay, we say uh, we don't allow racially restrictive covenants anymore. Um, oh, but we will build, you know, three miles of public housing overlooking a 14 lane highway. Um, and that's another form of containment. It shifts, right? What does it look like today? I mentioned this earlier, um, you know, we people do have choice, people do have more choices, certainly, um, but we still have um, a milieu in which, um, you know, again, BEZ did a great report that said, um, you know, for every one dollar, I think it was, lend, banks are lending 12 cents or 13 cents in, um, in black and brown communities, it was different by, um, by race, but, um, so we still don't have the same level of option. If you have a housing choice voucher, um, you are more likely to find rents that the voucher will cover um, in lower income neighborhoods. It's harder to find a landlord that will take it or, or that the rent will be covered um, in a higher income neighborhood, right? So there are structural barriers that remain and, uh, and I think that's what, that's what it looks like today, right? It doesn't look like, uh, mobs of angry people and arson in the middle of the night. It doesn't look like restrictive covenants. It looks different. Um, and where there may be less of those kinds of barriers, it isn't to say that they don't exist. And we have to, we have to solve for today's barriers in a very different way. Uh, just to very quickly add to that, um, you know, I would agree. We we don't have the, 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 the uh, you know, the, the signs, you know, uh, uh, that we might have had in the past, very overt signs. Um, uh, we have much more subtle things. We have structural barriers. But every now and then we do have 
very similar instances. I, I was, uh, the question draws me to an observation. I remember a few years back, uh, there was a housing advocacy group that took videos uh, of uh, King's, um, uh, 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 his time here in Chicago and the uh, very vocal backlash that, that he faced um, in terms of marches and, and, and other things. So we're talking about, you know, no segregate, oh, they were, they were pushing segregation here in Chicago. And they lined that video up with video of people in Jefferson Park protesting uh, plans for an affordable housing development that was being proposed for that neighborhood. And you would have thought, I mean, it was literally like, what, 40, almost 50 years uh, in between uh, those uh, occurrences, but you would have thought that you were still stuck in the middle of the, of the 1960s um, when you were looking at that video of the Jefferson Park residents um, uh, protesting uh, the proposal for an affordable housing development in their neighborhood. So we certainly have become much more sophisticated on some level, but there are times when, when we really, we kind of see it laid bare for us and, and some of that sentiment that we've lived with, the old segregation of old, this is, is, still, is still with us. Thank you. Um, just from resources that, that I have, for those of you that are really looking to get, you know, a handle on sort of the history of segregation in the U.S. and how the, the laws are still playing out today and we're, you know, trying to get away from, from some of um, the things that are just really built into to what we do. One would be, um, just because I had this near me, The Color Law by Richard Rothstein. Pick it up. Go to the library, get it, and also he has a ton of TED Talks too. Um, but it really gives a sort of in-your-face analysis of how we ended up getting to where we are today. Um, and then the second thing is, last year we had a webcast back in, oh gosh, I think it was February of 2021. It was hosted by the Housing and Urban uh, Community Development Division, Housing and Community Development, and it was a screening of the Shame of Chicago. Uh, the, the, the color tax screen, uh, screening. Um, and while we were not able to record it and post it on our YouTube channel, I'll tell you what, um, it, that was a heavy film. And it really goes into sort of some of the history of the, of the redlining and how we're still trying to get out of that today um, and make better decisions. I, I do know that it might be coming out um, and becoming more available to the general public without having to go in and actually request a screening and pay for it. And I'm pretty sure there's actually other editions of it uh, coming out. So those are just my two thoughts on the issue of the, the history of, of segregation, kind of where we're at, just coming from someone who likes planning history. Um, the other thing is um, kind of fundamental. Um, if, if, if you are a planner in a community that currently um, isn't looking at the issue of, of equity, um, of affordable housing, of inclusion, where is the first place that they should be starting? Should they be looking at the zoning code? Should they be starting community conversations, talking to their councils, their city managers, their mayors? Where is a planner? Where is that first step? What, what is it that, that, that we should be looking at first to try to get a pulse on to see kind of where we are as a community in, in terms of some of these issues. That's a tough one. Uh, I think that, well, if I could reflect on, this is not the same, but if I think about um, my experience at MPC, um, it is sort of figure out who your allies are and start building some support for the ways that you think things should be done and how they should be done differently. And uh, that may mean starting with colleagues at your level and if there's enough of you at your level that feel a certain way, then it's uh, more powerful when you bring it to someone above you to say, hey, we really think this should be done differently and here's our recommendation. Um, and um, so that would be my recommendation, start organizing with your peers and see how far you can get. 
Um, and then if you can't get very far, you know, start organizing around um, leadership that will get you there. Um, I think, you know, my experience um, with this administration is that I've had uh, a mayor who opened the door wide open and said, oh, that's your roadmap, that's your plan, go do it. Uh, and that's a that's just an incredible opportunity. And um, as opposed to, um, you know, what might be a much harder road if you don't have that uh, that support from the top. The only thing I would add is just that I think that uh, it, it may sound cliched, but all things are possible. Um, uh, I just think people have to have their eyes open to the inherent challenges uh, with regard to racial inequity. That it, It's there and you, you just kind of have to face it. But even in that, what it is that you hope to achieve, um, you may be able to find a way to do it and, and to trust 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 your gut when it says this is possible. This is something that we can do. I see a way to get there, even if it may be unconventional, even if it may seem like, you know what, it hasn't happened in this community for 40 years, but I'm looking at this and I think I think this is a way to get it done. Trust, trust, trust those instincts and move forward. And the only thing I'll say to that is that, you know, I, you know, I mentioned I you know, grew up in Auburn Gresham, just south of Inglewood and West Inglewood, and I would have never thought I'd see the day when there would be a Chipotle, uh, a Starbucks, <laughs> and a Whole Foods in Inglewood. And they're there on the same corner lot uh, in 63rd and Halstead. Um, there was a planner in the in Department of Planning and Development in the city of Chicago who saw a way to make it happen. Um, there was support for, for it from the top and, and they pushed forward and, and they made it happen. And so I would say if that can happen in Inglewood, man, you know, there's a lot more that we should be doing and seeing uh, in terms of development uh, across the city of Chicago, if, if, if that can happen at 63rd and Halston. So it's 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 possible. And my my example is, isn't necessarily about, um, but you, you brought it to mind. So Calumet High School is closed right now. And so at the height of COVID, I shouldn't say the height of COVID, the onset of COVID in 2020, the city dealing with the pandemic, right? They converted a lot of spaces into emergency COVID use. Particularly, they turned Calumet High School into a homeless shelter because our home we needed to social distance our homeless residents, right? And so Calumet uh, gave them that ability. Uh, but then they also like put up a thousand or two thousand beds at McCormick Place, right? They ended up not needing the beds at McCormick Place. So they shut the McCormick base beds down, but they didn't shut down the Calumet ones. Now to city planning, there's a reason why high schools are placed where they're placed in neighborhoods because they they allow for the people in the neighborhood to get to the high school and then get out of the high school to the entirety of the neighborhood. But that same accessibility ain't necessarily the best thing for a population of Chicagoans who need our help and support, i.e. the homeless. And so we went using history, uh, we went to our Ottoman and we say, hey, um, okay, the numbers have subsided to where you don't need to keep this thing happening and people's lawnmowers are coming up missing. But then not only that, this homeless population is attracting warring drug factions. May, Alberton, Morgan, these blocks didn't necessarily have shootouts and such because they were like neutral zones for different factions. But then when you put a thousand uh, potential customers, right, because we, as we understand it, our, our homeless residents sometimes are, are dealing with addiction issues. And so that was attracting violence to Calumet. Using the city against the city, it, it, as, as I understand you guys are saying, is what we did. We say, hey, okay, you had an emergency use. That emergency use is over. Now you need to have a public hearing. You need to have this. You need to have that. You need to have zoning. You need to have so many things before you can turn Calumet into a, a permanent a homeless shelter. And what my neighbors did is that, that we knocked on doors. They came to my door, they said, hey, Sherman, you might need to not buy a pair of Jordans this month. We need $200 from you because we're getting ready to get a lawyer. We're going to retain a lawyer. And they did. And then that lawyer went to Alderman Brookings and said, hey, this is the city statute. And we we're getting ready to, to, to file a claim. Right. And I came home from work and there were CTA buses parked behind Calumet. And they were not only moving the homeless residents out, but they were moving all the equipment out. And now there's talk about returning Calumet to something like a fitness center or a community center for multiple non-for-profits, right? But that doesn't happen 
if you don't dig in. And so uh, that same type of thing, as we're dealing with our racial uh, equity here in the city, you can use, um, as he just said, this is what happened 40 years ago. Well, there was probably a mandate that made that possible 40 years ago that's still on the books. There may be rules and, and, and different ordinances that help keep a place like Wicker Park flourishing that also apply to our progression. You just have to use those tools uh, 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 to get equity in those type of situations. Thank you. Um, we have to wrap up here. Everyone, stick with me for just a second before you X out. Um, this year with the uh, with the webcast series, um, I always try to do something a little different, a little unique every year. This year, my professional kind of word of the year is um, activate. And so you all get to come on this journey with me. And um, one of the things that I want to do with the webcast at the very end of it is to kind of give you a go uh, uh, something that you need to do, something that you need to run with from this conversation um, and, and do something with in your community. So coming from a planner to the majority of planners here uh, listening in, from this conversation, the things, my, my quick takeaways are one, to, to understand the history of segregation, particularly in your communities, where it came from, how it is still alive and well today in your community. And then two, give yourself a community, give your community an audit to figure out where you are today um, along the spectrum and come up with a, some ideas of ways in which you can chop that list down um, and really create an equitable, community. And the last thing that I'll say is for sure, a lot of people are afraid of politics, policy, advocacy. Just know that a lot of your APA chapters are out there advocating um, on, on your behalf as membership. Um, in the policy world, APA National um, does the same thing. They have a great policy team. So, you know, when we're talking about giving um, folks uh more affordable housing benefits, um, our private sector trying to engage them more and give them reasons to build affordable, talking with private institutions to give out fair mortgages and financing, things like that. It's out there, it's happening. So please engage, engage with your APA chapter, engage with APA National, because we're out there trying to do policy work all on your behalf and of course you could use your help. So that's the end, I think. Um, thanks to my all-star lineup for joining us today. I know that a couple of you we haven't been able to see, and I'm so sorry. Um, again, we are recording this, posting on our YouTube channel. If you need your uh, the code for AICP credits, just head over to our website, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast, and there you'll be able to get the name, um, the, uh, the number, and, and the title for that. Don't forget too, to register for some of our upcoming se sessions. We have a great lineup coming up. Um, I think that's it. Thank you, APA Illinois, for hosting today. And again, to our panelists, um, everyone have a great weekend. Stay safe. We'll talk next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.